All right, Pittsburgh Steelers fans, it is Monday, which means it's time for the Monday morning conversation of this Let's Ride podcast. I welcome in Derek Bell, writes for SteelersNow.com. Derek, how's it going? How's it going, man? Yeah, uh, free agency on the on the docket here. We're coming off NFL oh. Combine off season. You know, off season is in full swing, so ready to ready to see some movement. See see what the Steelers do. Or as I like to say, what off season? Because I don't ever know what an off season is with the Pittsburgh Steelers, with the NFL. It's just this constant wheel that just keeps on moving. The theme of today's discussion is going to be how bad is it? Or maybe how bad was it in certain circumstances? Because I love to pick people's brains, especially people like yourself who watch film, break down the film. They see things differently than I do. I'm just a fan, man. I watch these games from my couch. I don't watch the all 22. I don't know what the hell the difference is between a cover four and a cover three. I just want the Steelers to win games. That's it. But you know this more than I do. Where are we going to start? You know where we're going to start. The quarterback position, man. Kenny Pickett, how bad is it? How bad was it? That's what I want to get your take on last year and what you think about Kenny Pickett. Yeah, I mean, it's – I feel like this point, you know, has been – hammered home and you know at the same time probably not discussed with all the context involved i mean i think it's very obvious you know that matt canada that the decision to hire matt canada um was a questionable one was something that i was baffled by you know really from the jump but bringing him back for you know a third season a second season with kenny pickett i, th I think that was really the nail in the coffin there yeah uh, i think the steelers just got you know they got kind of hoodwinked or bamboozled uh into like some of the late late season success in 2022 and we're hoping that that was going to continue on to 2023 and you know things just didn't uh materialize that way and you know Canada's system it's it's just very bland there are a lot of things that I have issues with uh, just from a fundamental level but you know I, I think it is important to separate some of the things that he was dealing with within his environment with also his poor play. And I think that both of those things can be true. I think a lot of people try to say it was either all the quarterback or all the offensive coordinator. If you really look at the film, you look at the numbers, I, I think it's just one of those situations where it's both, man. You know, there, there was, yeah. it was underwhelming results really across the board. And, you know, that's how you lead to, you know, a quarterback controversy late in the season. And then ultimately where we are right now, heading into free agency, um, you know, wondering what type of player they're going to add to the position. Everything I hate about this scenario with Kenny Pickett and the Canada situation is that everything is a small sample size. So when yep. you think about it, 2022, rookie year, what do we have? Small sample size of success down the stretch. They win their final four games. They win seven of nine. And everyone, like you said, thought, okay, this is going to roll over to the next year. It doesn't. He gets canned, meaning Matt Canada. He gets fired midseason. What do we see? Six quarters of Kenny Pickett without Matt Canada. What are we supposed to do with that? So – I, I just feel like the entire situation, and I don't stand in one camp, man, just to be clear. Like, I don't, I'm not the Kenny Pickett devout supporter that'll stand behind him until the day they die. And I'm also not the person that's trying to, you know, sacrifice him to the football gods and hang him high in the streets, which some people sure. want. I think that for me, like with Pickett, based on your film study, have you seen anything at all that says yay or nay as it pertains to Kenny Pickett as potentially the QB1 for the Steelers moving forward? Yeah, I mean, so I'll just kind of take you back to my thoughts on Pickett really coming out of college. Um, I, I had a third round grade on him, and I, my kind of thought process was that there was baseline starter kind of potential here. And in the right system, you might be able to get, and when I say system, like really with the right environment, you know, the perfect offensive coordinator situation that really fits with his strengths. And then, you know, a really good supporting cast, you may be able to get, you know, a guy that you can win games with. Now, yeah. That obviously has not materialized just yet, um, but, you know, the door is not necessarily closed. The thing that I really have found a difficult time over the course of the two years, you talked about the small sample size. There's there's a small sample size of play, but I just I've struggled to find any tangible things or traits or things that he does extremely well to really grasp onto and say, OK, this is what I'm going to build the offense around. So. We can talk about some of, the, some of the other quarterback options and some of the guys that they're potentially looking at. But usually with quarterbacks, you know, what you want to do is you want to try to figure out, OK, you know, obviously these are the three things they do well. So, for example, Russell Wilson, 
He's got, you know, the deep ball, and he's always been very good in playmaking situations and off play action. So, like, those three things are the things that you can, like, build the offense around, even if it's not going to be really robust or, you know, this complex or complete offensive structure. Justin Fields, he's got the mobility and the deep ball. So, there are a lot of things in between there that he just doesn't do really well at this point in time. He doesn't play within structure. He doesn't throw on time. With Pickett, it's just difficult because the tools are, you know, not really what you think of with, you know, a first round quarterback, you know, the arm strength, you know, he's a guy who can move around a little bit, but he's not really a threat as a, as a runner. And he hasn't been overly effective as a playmaker outside of structure. So it's just difficult to find that one or two things to really hang your hat on and say, okay, this is how we're going to build the offense. And I think that's, it's scary when you're heading into year three and you're still asking yourself those questions. Well, what do you think about the other options? I mean, you mentioned Russell Wilson. Obviously, that's the big name on, on Steeler fans' mind because he came into Pittsburgh. He visited this past weekend. As of this being recorded, he has not signed with anyone yet. What are your thoughts on Russell Wilson just as an option? Yeah, I mean, I wrote a full piece on Russ uh, for SteelersNow.com. And, you know, after watching about six games, I mean, Russ is – he's still Russ. I mean, it's a very, he's a very unique quarterback because there is no system that Russ fits into. Russ is the system. Like he only does, he does a few things. He does them extremely, extremely well. And then there's really not much else. There's a lot of things that he just does not do very well. He doesn't throw over the middle of the field. He doesn't really throw with anticipation. He holds onto the ball long. He takes sacks, but the things that he does extremely well, one of the better deep ball throwers really of his generation. He's, always been outstanding um, outside of the pocket and in playmaking situations with, you know, really elite creation capacity. The problem is the reason that Russ's game has it translated very well, like as he's gotten older with his athleticism kind of dipping a little bit, that play style, he just hasn't been able to adjust. Whereas a lot of like pocket passers, I mean, we saw the same thing with Ben, you know, in his thirties and you see it with a lot of quarterbacks, once they get into the thirties, they play some of their best ball, but that's because, you know, the mental aspect has caught up to their physical traits or even yeah. surpassed their physical traits. And, you know, those pocket passers, they can just nickel and dime you from the pocket and really pick you apart. And Russ just isn't that type of quarterback. He's never been that type of guy. He's always been a guy that's relied on his athleticism and the deep ball and the playmaking. So, is he an upgrade over what Pickett's brought them over the last two years? Yeah, I think so. But at the same time, you know, Russ isn't getting any younger. Yeah, He's not going to be more athletic next year than he was this past year, even after he slimmed down. So um, it, it's an interesting situation that's really unique just because of the offset language in his contract. You know, he's yeah. going to be vet men, really cheap. Um, but he's he might be an upgrade, but he's not a solution. You know, especially with uh, Arthur Smith's offense, I just think that that's it's a wonky fit. I'll just say that. Well, what about Mason Rudolph? I mean, he finished the season. Well, again, what's the theme here in this offensive talk? Small sample size. You know, he hasn't really done it for any length of time, but he did enough. His stock has never been higher in his entire career. What's your take on Mason Rudolph? Yeah, I mean, the thing with Mason is I, I think really what you're looking for there is, you know, the small sample size with him being 29, I mean, the guys that we'll just say like breakout, I, I wouldn't necessarily call the finish to last season a breakout, but the guys that break out that late, they typically don't sustain their success. Um, and I think with Mason, the things that he does well, I'm not really sure that that's a really great fit for what Arthur Smith wants to do either. Even Mason's success last year, there was a very limited sample size of him throwing over the middle of the field and that's really what arthur smith wants to do you know mason can push the ball down the field it hits him he was awesome throwing the ball down the field to pickens giving him some uh some shots in one-on-one situations but you know our they don't really have anybody on the roster right now whether that's you know rudolph if he comes back or Pickett, who's really you know fits what arthur smith likes to do in terms of like under center gun play action ripping the ball with timing anticipation in between defenders over the middle of the field It's just not either one of their games. So I just think, you know, when you're talking about adding another piece to the equation with Pickett, because we think, I mean, we're 99% sure he's going to be on the roster. I think that you're going to want somebody who's at least a good schematic fit, even if, you know, Mason's proven that he's definitely a quality backup or somebody that you want on your team. It's just, I'm not really sure that he's the best, he's the best fit for the actual system. So outside of Ryan Tannehill, who just happens to be a free agent and has the connections with Arthur Smith, is there anyone 
quarterback as a free agent, or I'll even say in the draft that Mm -hmm. we let's be honest with where the Steelers are selecting and where they would probably be looking at quarterback, which is not in the, on day one or day two, most likely. Is there anyone that piques your interest and says, this guy actually does fit with Arthur Smith wants to do, you know, not in particularly uh, in terms of I'm this. Sure. <laughs> yeah. In terms of this system, I mean, I think that McCarthy has been a guy that people have liked for all of the, you know, play action heavy systems yeah. just because, you know, he comes from a pro style offense. He's a guy who will absolutely rip the ball over the middle. I mean, you talked about Tannehill. The reason why it worked so well in Tennessee with Tannehill and art was, you know, Tannehill is this guy who has almost an undying blind faith, in the structure of the offense or the play call. Tannehill is going to hit his back foot and he is going to throw the ball where it's intended to go based on how it's written up on the playbook. (laughs) It doesn't matter if there's a safety sitting there or if there's a linebacker sitting there, he is going to gun that ball in. And I think that that is just so much different than, you know, what we've become accustomed to in Pittsburgh. And that's why people say, you know, oh, he's a good system. It's not just that he's played for art. It's just the way that he's programmed mentally and upstairs to play. It's how art wants, wants to play. And, um, you know, there, there's not really other options. I mean, I've, I've pointed out that, you know, it may be the, it would not be like a sexy signing and it's probably a situation where, you know, they would still go with Kenny Pickett to start the season. It wouldn't really probably be much of a quarterback conversation. I would, I'm still on the train that I would like to see them bring in Jacoby Brissett. I think that Jacoby's played, Jacoby played extremely good ball for Stefanski two years ago, you know, can do some of the things in terms of he can operate quick game out of empty. He can, you know, do the under center play action stuff. He is a pretty good thrower down the field. He's going to throw the ball over the middle. Like, I think that those are all things that could fit relatively well. Jacoby's not the most mobile of uh, cats in the league, you know, has that elongated throwing motion, but he does have good arm strength. If they're going to go with somebody that's a veteran quarterback, that would be my choice just because he may not have the scheme familiarity that Tannehill does, but I think he's a better player at this stage of his career after kind of watching both guys this offseason. So he's a name to watch. I'm not sure. I mean, the Steelers have had chances to get him in the past and they haven't. So who knows? Maybe that changes this season. Last question about the offense before we go to the defense. And Mm -hmm. it's a yes or no question. I don't like doing that, but I'm going to expect you to expound a little bit. Would you trade Deontay Johnson if you got a good deal? Yeah, it's it's really tough, right? Like, (laughs) uh, I've always been a guy on Twitter who has defended Deontay. I've always thought that he's better than people gave him credit for, even with some of the, you know, some of the weaknesses in his game that are, you know, very well expanded on. But I, I think in terms of, you know, a route runner, a guy that creates separation for himself, doesn't need the scheme to get him open. Uh, Some of the things that he's done over the years just in like ISO situations have been incredibly valuable. And I don't think people really appreciate how difficult that job is in and of itself. Now, I think that there's a situation here based on what I know indirectly and kind of what I'm reading between the lines. I think that both sides here kind of just want a fresh start. And I think that that's um, it's just a situation. You know, he's interested in he's entering the last year of his contract. You know, there was some there was a lot of dysfunction last year in the wide receiver room. You know, and I think that, you know, it's difficult for, you know, Johnson going into a contract year based on the steel, what the Steelers could potentially do in terms of bringing Kenny Pickett back. They're going to be a very, very run heavy offense, regardless of who's at quarterback. Right. Is it going to be possible for him to get the numbers that he wants in order to cash in again? Because that was a big thing when he took that extension a couple of years ago. The big thing is he took a shorter extension because he wanted to come back to the table quicker. And like, that was a business move on his part. He wanted to come back to the table before he hit 30. And it's hard to really think that, you know, if Kenny Pickett's going to be the quarterback and they're going to be in a run heavy system, is this the place where he's going to go out and be able to get 12, 1300 yards and, you know, six, seven, eight touchdowns and go to the market next off season and cash in again. I, I just don't think that that's the case. So I think the Steelers based on, you know, his cap it, some of the things that they could save, you know, they might be able to get, a little bit in return for him and this receiver class coming out of the draft is absolutely fantastic. I mean, it's loaded. There's all kinds of talent up at the top, but there's depth too. I mean, you're going to be able to find legitimate starting caliber receivers to complement, you know, a number one guy all the way into like the third, fourth round. So wow. this is one of those situations where they may just be looking at the options that are going to be available to them and saying like, all right, maybe, maybe this is something we at least explore. And there's a lot of smoke around that, that, you know, they're at least listening. And I, I do know that, um, you know, teams are going to be interested. Teams are going to be calling, you know, Buffalo comes to mind, Kansas city comes to mind, 
guys like uh, teams like that that have a really established quarterback who are looking for a guy who can separate on the outside. Deontay's gonna have he's gonna have suitors. We'll see. We'll see how that goes. Now let's go to the yep. defense because I'm a, I'm someone. I realize that Mike Tomlin is a defensive head coach, and I realize that his fingerprints are all over the defense. But I have yet to ever get a bead from anyone that knows way more than I do about Terrell Austin as a coordinator. We mm-hmm. rip Matt Canada to shreds on the offensive side, and yet the defense doesn't always perform well, and yet no one really talks about Terrell Austin as a coordinator. And maybe it's because of the defensive head coach and the, the all of the stuff that I just mentioned. But let's talk back to go back to the the crux of the podcast. How bad is it? What are your thoughts on Terrell Austin, his scheme? I personally hated what I saw with Minka Fitzpatrick. What is your take on the defense and, and as a whole? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the biggest things I think the Steelers have to answer. You know, this there, there are a ton of options, different flavors, different skill sets available in free agency when it comes to the safety position. I think one of the bigger questions that the Steelers have to answer internally this season is what their plan is for Mika Fitzpatrick. You've got a guy who you are paying a ton of money. He is, you know, has been an elite contributor when he's been healthy. Of course, last season was kind of of a lost season with all the injuries and, you know, him playing what I think most of us would categorize as out of position. You know, is what's the plan for him going forward? Is he's gonna is he gonna be this move around chess piece? Is he gonna be a, go back to being a center fielder? Build the secondary around that. Don't you know his versatility is nice to have, and you can obviously use it as a crunch. But I would prefer them say like, what does he do best? Which I think we would all agree is probably play in the center field. And let's put him in the center field. Let's build the safety room around him. All right, what do we need to go get? Do we need to go get a box safety? Do we need to go get a guy? who can man up on tight ends when they go man to man situations on third down, second, third down, those things. And, you know, that's a big part of the scheme thing that I think a lot of people are worried about. You know, I think that Austin did a fine job last season, just based on the cards that he was dealt. You know, they had some unfortunate injuries really up the spine of the defense, you know, the safety room, the inside linebacker room was just decimated. And to be quite honest with you, you know, with Cam Hayward missing a good chunk of the season, Larry Ogunjobi underperforming really since he signed that contract, there, there was more holes on the defense than I feel like people were willing to admit. And, you know, they really lack speed in the back end. So they've got some they've got some things that they got to get corrected this offseason. And I don't want to, um, you know, I, I, that really is going overshadowed right now because of all the quarterback con- conversation. Yeah. But, you know, I think Austin did a fine job. I, I lean towards, you know, I do like that the Steelers have been more aggressive in terms of playing man coverage. I do think that Austin's system can sometimes be a little bit too vanilla for me in terms of, um, you know, some of the stuff they do blitzing. Like, I think that they could be more creative up front in terms of the looks that they present and getting guys one-on-one situations. But, you know, he's he showed more of a willingness to be aggressive. And I also think he deserves credit along with, you know, the secondary coach and some of the assistants for, you know, putting Joy Porter Jr. in a really good position to succeed early on. You know, they, they didn't try to make Porter something that he wasn't. They allowed him to play at the line of scrimmage use his physicality, use his length instead of trying to pigeonhole him in to a system that he didn't really fit because he's not a guy that's going to be able to play off the ball, play, you know, in a back pedal. That's not his game. You want him close and in those like close combat quarters. So I think he deserves credit for some of the stuff. I understand that, you know, when you have such a highly paid defense and you, you know, the Tomlin defenses in the past have not performed well in the playoffs, you're going to draw criticism and rightfully so. Um, but I'm perfectly fine with, you know, the decision to bring him back and roll with him for another season. Uh, real quick, because uh, you brought him up, Joey Porter Jr., well, what's your take on him? Because there's a lot of people that love his game. There's a lot of people that say he's way too handsy, was one of the most penalized uh, defensive backs in the NFL last season. After a rookie year, what's your take on his game? Yeah, I mean, all of those things, the concerns about the handsiness, you know, the penalties, all those things, you know, he was number two last year in penalties, um, you know, thrown on him flags uh, only to Legere Sneet of the Chiefs. So, you know, Porter, to me, again, has some absolutely elite traits, the way that he plays in press, the way that he uses his link, can squeeze receivers to the sideline, was very good at the catch point, just incredibly disruptive. And I think that You know, he was so sticky in coverage last year. There are some obvious drawbacks with the way that he plays and that physicality. He's going to draw some penalty flags, but I think the the rewards far outweigh the risk. You know, the positives far outweigh the negative with him. Look at some of the things that he did last year. You know, you go back and watch the tape of, you know, I think back to Calvin Ridley, who I think is a good player, you know, a legitimate number one wide receiver in the NFL. And, you know, Porter had him in the gulag. I mean, he 
he couldn't do anything. I mean, he was smothering him all day. And I think that, you know, it's become more common to see these, um, you know, college corners come out and contribute right away. Whereas, you know, five, six, seven years ago, that was, you know, kind of faux pas. We never saw that. But I think seven on seven and the rule changes, th these guys are so much more used to how the game's played right now that they're able to come in and contribute. But Porter's going to be a very, very good player. I'm, I'm fully convinced. I mean, I would be absolutely shocked if he wasn't one of the best corners in the league. Um, really health permitting uh, in this type of system that's going to allow him to play at the line of scrimmage. Yeah, I, I'm all in. I, I think that, you know, the penalties will probably always be there. It, it doesn't bother me at all. I think that the, the value that he brings in terms of being able to shut down one side of the field is very, very valuable. So let's start talking a little bit about how the Steelers might be out of shape their roster now with free agency upon us. The tampering period starts today on Monday. And so let's start with defense. You know, defense, Patrick Peterson gets cut at, uh, towards the end of last week. Uh, Keanu Neal fails a physical. He's released. And now you're looking at a lot of holes. Levi Wallace is obviously a free agent. You go to the interior of the defense. Uh, Cole Holcomb, no one knows about his health status. Quan Alexander is yep. not an answer. Not Also not on the roster with the ruptured Achilles tendon. Let's start on the outside and the secondary. In free agency, are there any players that you are targeting that you're like, you know what, I think these would be great fits, and let's keep in mind what the Steelers like to do in terms of free agency, and that's they're never really the big spender, but are there any players that fit in the secondary? And let's also keep in mind what you said about Minka Fitzpatrick and how they should sculpt it around him. Yeah, and I think, you know, you like like we said, there there's holes on this defense that they're going to have to get uh, situated. But I also think that, you know, it's easy to look at it both ways and say, okay, we lost a ton of snaps. Like you mentioned, Patrick Peterson, Levi Wallace, you know, even Quan before he got hurt. These guys all played a ton for the Steelers last year. Keanu Neal before he got hurt. Um, but I but I also think that there's there are avenues to get better players for those snaps. For, you know, not even without spending a significant amount of money. Those guys were not impact players. They were more of those auxiliary pieces on defense. True. In terms of things that I'm looking for, I think there are some inside linebacker options that, you know, intrigue me. I think that the safety group, if they come out of free agency without a three down starter at the safety position, I would both be shocked and disappointed. There are so many guys, depending on what they think of Minka, what they want to do with him. You know, if, if they want to have their safeties be incredibly, um, you know, if, if they want to move them around and have them almost interchangeable, a guy like Julian Blackman uh, from the Colts makes a lot of sense to me. You know, he played free safety for the first couple of years of his career. Last year, played a little bit more in the box for Gus Bradley. Very good player. Uh, he's a guy who does a little bit of everything, you know, in the back end. There's other guys, you know, that I really like too. Jordan Whitehead, obviously a familiar face with the pit connections. Um, has been a very, very highly regarded run defender, very physical, but also in coverage, very, very fluid you know, can can do some nice things in the back end. He played a little bit deeper, you know, in that quarter system for the Jets. And then even an inside linebacker, you know, Jerome Baker, I think is a name that's been thrown out a lot. You know, he's a guy that I think, you know, is really intriguing if they can get him for the right price. I know that Miami wants him back and is, you know, trying to, you know, persuade him to come back on a, you know, a different contract, but I expect the Steelers to definitely be involved there. And, you know, th those things can, like those guys in particular can give you, solid production and fill holes. And I think that that's the big thing that you're trying to do with free agency. You don't want to go into the draft with all these really specific needs that lead you to having to reach on a specific position or a specific player instead of just letting the board come to you, you know, on draft weekend. It's going to be interesting. You know, you bring up those linebackers and, and there's people that say like, go after Patrick queen. Cause Patrick queen has the athleticism that a lot of Steeler fans think that the team misses since Ryan Chazier got injured in 2017 on Monday night football in Cincinnati. Do you feel like the Steelers within the land and Roberts, who is your traditional inside linebacker, will label him as a thumper. Do you mm -hmm. feel like the Steelers do need to have an athletic compliment to him? That is more sideline to sideline, more athleticism, or is that just a fan narrative that you don't really agree with? Yeah. I mean, I think of, you know, with the inside linebacker position for one, the NFL is just, horrific at evaluating talent at that position. I mean, we've seen the success rate or the hit rate on guys that get drafted early on is it's one of the worst in terms of position wise. And I think what you're seeing is with the safety position too, you're seeing a lot of teams take these 
sign these veterans for really specific roles and almost build the room like a basketball team where it's like, okay, this guy does this really well. This guy does this really well. Instead of searching and spending bigger money or taking bigger shots in the draft in terms of trying to figure out somebody that can do it all. Because realistically, man, we just don't have very many good inside linebackers in the league right now. It's one of the least talented position groups. And a guy like Queen, I think you could – potentially fool yourself into thinking that he was one of those guys in terms of, you know, being this guy that was really athletic, great in coverage, could play the run. I'm not sure that I, he's not a guy that I would spend big money on. Now that's not to say that it won't, but you know, I would prefer them go after a guy when I'm talking about positions or skills that I want to add to the room. I want somebody that's going to be adept in coverage, you know, coverage linebackers kind of a, there aren't very many good linebackers in coverage, but someone who at least holds their own in coverage and I would like somebody who is a little more athletic. So that's kind of the idea behind like Jerome Baker was the athletic guy coming in out of college. He's still just 27. A guy like Blake Cashman for the Texans dealt with a lot of injuries, but finally got the chance to play last season, uh, was able to stay healthy, had some really good moments in coverage. Guy who's has some serious, serious juice uh, running sideline to sideline, getting downhill. So I think that, you know, adding more athleticism to the room, with that thumper mentality you talked about with Landon Roberts and, you know, Holcomb's a guy who likes to run and hit. I think that those, you know, that could be a pretty, um, a pretty well-rounded group that you can kind of mix and match depending on, you know, personnel or play distance, anything like that. I think the Steelers will make a trade for someone like uh, Snead in Kansas city. I know that's been a talking point, but that would be a big, big ask. I think. Yeah. I mean, they've, I know they've, you know, it's been reported that they've called, you know, Nick Faribault talked about, you know, that that was something that, you know, we were told at the combine that they've at least called and checked in on that. Personally, I think that Snee's a very good player. He was also somebody that I studied and wrote about um, in terms of, you know, is he worth a guy to sign, you know, close to 20 million. He again with same thing with Porter. There's some grabbiness there, some over aggressiveness. But in terms of, you know, his versatility, he's a guy that can play on the boundary. He can play in the slot. He's had, you know, good playmaking numbers, although the interceptions weren't quite there last season. Just a guy who extremely good mover, transitions extremely well, fluid, change of direction ability, all there. And he's a guy that consistently competes at the catch point. So he would be somebody that, you know, you talk about a real, real difference maker adding to the defense. He definitely fits that box. Now, I think trading a second ish round pick, which has been the reported asking price, I'm not sure that they would get that. And then on top of that, paying him a salary of, you know, 20 million. That's a lot. I mean, it's just really, really difficult at the corner position with how volatile it is season to season to pay that type of investment off. But, you know, it's a big swing. I I don't, I would be surprised if they did that. I think that we will probably see, I think James Daniels is still the most expensive free agent that they've ever signed in free agency, right? Like eight or nine, eight or nine million on the season. I think that there's a chance we could see a a double digit APY signing this cycle for the Steelers. Like one. Like one, I'm not saying they're going to go spend in 17, 18 million, but it wouldn't surprise me if they sign somebody for like three for 30, three for 33, something like that. A wow, guy that okay. if, if they were going to do that, if they were going to do that, the safety position is one to keep an eye on, I think, because okay. while I'm not sure that that's the best team building philosophy in terms of, you know, paying two safeties a lot of money. There's just a lot of really enticing players in terms of skill sets that I would be, you know, intrigued by. I think the top of the market guys, Duggar, Winfield will remain where they're at. There's also some guys like Cam Curl for Washington has been a very, very good player. Also, Xavier McKinney, former first round pick, a guy that they, you know, met with a little bit uh, before he was coming out of Alabama. Like those type of players, it would not surprise me if they tried to get them on that type of range of deal. Love it. Love it. Now, last question for you on the offensive side of the ball. Clearly, Mason Cole gets released. Allen Robinson gets released. We knew those were coming, maybe not at the time. Mm -hmm. Center and receiver, I think, are other positions that they're going to have to target in free agency. Anyone pique your interest at those positions? I'll tell you, uh, a guy that I really enjoy watching play and would be a really dynamic fit in Arthur Smith's offense is Aaron Brewer for the Titans center, a guy who is – I try to stay away from using the word elite, but this dude is a rare, rare athlete at the position. He's undersized. You know, he actually has a really fun story. He came out of college after he beefed up. And he was only 274 pounds. I think he plays heavier than that now, but he is a yeah. he's a smaller dude. But this dude 
flies off of the ball. I mean, some of the, he makes some of the most incredible reach blocks that you will ever see in terms of that wide zone system. He's a great fit. The only thing is with Brewer, you got to make sure you have sturdy guards beside him because he's not the best in power and pass protection. And really the reason for that is when he gets matched up with guys that just have a lot of, you know, power capacity, they just overwhelming because of his size. So yeah. I know that that would be something that would scare Steelers fans away, but the rewards in terms of what he could do for the run game, uh, very, very significant. So he's a good player. I mean, there's other centers available. Mitch Morse is available. He's been a good player, a quality player for a long time. There's options there. I would probably prefer them to at least try to get a starter in free agency. And then, you know, if, if they really like a guy like Zach Frazier or whatever in the second round from West Virginia, taking him and kind of bringing him along slowly. The receiver position is a little bit different because, you know, Arthur Smith just doesn't use a lot of 11 personnel. So it's a lot of two receiver sets. Depending on what happens with Deontay Johnson, that could take the receiver need uh, up, That's up true. a lot. You know, yeah. if, if they trade him, then that becomes a significant need. But in terms of if, if both of those guys are back in the fold, meaning Pickens and Johnson, the need for a third receiver, it's hard to it's hard to really say that they should invest, you know, a first or second round pick or go sign a guy in free agency. If they wanted to spend a little money, I think Josh Reynolds is a nice player uh, from mm -hmm. Detroit. He's a guy who can play inside, outside, really, really tough over the middle can make catches away from his frame. I think that that fits the type of receiver that Smith typically gravitates towards. Some other guys that I like, Noah Brown from Houston, really, really tough blocker, very competitive, kind of an underdog story. Kind of when I was doing um, his film room stuff a couple of weeks ago for a video that I did on my YouTube channel, um, he torched Cincinnati. Like over the past two meetings with Cincinnati, he has like over – uh, over 200 yards receiving. He's caught a touchdown. He had the chance to play this past season due to some injuries against Cincy, and he went off. It was like 10 for 151 and one. So I always think, you know, the Steelers typically do give a second look to guys that, you know, play very well against them. I'm yeah. thinking to myself, why don't they just go out and get somebody who's absolutely torched Cincinnati? So <laughs> that would be kind of a cool uh, – and he's going to be relatively cheap. I think you could get him on a probably – two-year deal for you know four million uh per year or something like that and i think that he definitely has enough uh, upside as a blocker and just how tough he is as a receiver to pay off that type of investment it's great stuff this is like a perfect primer for all the Steeler fans out there getting ready for free agency want to know what they're going to do some potential names out there derek i do appreciate it i want you to plug the youtube channel that you just mentioned your work that Steelers now anything else that you want to plug go ahead and do that right now yeah, uh, you can find me on Twitter and on YouTube at Steelers underscore DB, also on the screen. Um, you know, for Steelers now, pretty much everything that you guys heard uh, me and Jeff discuss, just kind of the nerdy uh, football X's <laughs> and O's, player detail breakdowns, scheme breakdowns. That's kind of uh, my role uh, with Steelers now. But, you know, I love talking ball. I appreciate you having me on, man. No problem. Thanks a lot. And uh, make sure we'll, hey, we'll be in touch maybe after free agency. We'll, re we'll evaluate Absolutely. some of these signings. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot.